this is so sad this is our, we need to follow your professional story, your political story uh, through the media for the last couple of decades. But when you were growing up, where was politics? What were you thinking of becoming? That story, what do you want to be when you grow up? Well, I used to walk around with a ruler. I walk around and beat the desk because I wanted to be a teacher. <laughs> and I did become a teacher before I became a lawyer and a politician. In fact, I lectured at the University of the West Indies in Jamaica and as well as at um, Cavill, not Cavill, uh, St. Augustine. I came to Barbados and I was having my son, I was bearing my son uh, when I came to Barbados and I signed up to teach here as well. So I would have been lecturing at all three, but it was too hard. And so I had my son here. Um, in terms of, I think the job that we do, and from way back when, cannot be done without some level of spirituality. You mentioned God. I have a famous slogan that I use all the time. Put God in front and walk behind. And therefore the challenges that we face, and especially politicians will tell you, I mean, you have your own, we all have our challenges. We have the power struggles just always become more public in newspapers. But each of us in our jobs, we have the, 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 the office politics as it were. And I don't think I could have sustained and stayed in this, this part of my job. I enjoyed the lecturing, I enjoyed the teaching, been there, done that. So I did achieve what I first wanted to be, which was a teacher and then became a lecturer. But in the politics game, it is rough. It is rough. <laughs> Uh, my sister Mia will tell you it is rough, but you know what is what you said is a passion is never give up, never give up. And why? What helps you not to give up? Put God in front and walk behind. That spirit that he gives you the strength when the day comes and everybody about talking to you. And not about talking to you, just in the social media, it was all over the newspapers, it's on the TV, it's everywhere. Last day you say, God, thank you for my life. <laughs> but please, you will not give me more than I can give. I want to ask you this question. When you're seeing that and you're hearing that and it's just buffeting you from all sides, where then is your source of respite? Is it a family member? Is it reading? Is it music? Mm -hmm. Well, a bit of all of the above, but I've been very blessed. I think Donna mentioned it and others may say the same. I've been very blessed to have a very stable family relationship with my husband. In fact, when I stopped going to school in Sabara, when I was 16, I was in fact following my future husband. <laughs> oh, I've gone here before to study in England. So he has been with me, I mean, I've been married for more years than you can go. And I'm married to the same person, by the way. <laughs> All these years, that's very important. So that's stable, that's stability. Uh, Donna said it very clearly, and why she said, yeah, I was thinking, you know, if you really had the hustle with your husband, if you didn't have his support, and you mentioned Indo, uh, Indo men, and what I mentioned that too for Indo men, Indo women, you don't have Indo women out there, out in the public face. So for the family, it is a very, very difficult thing. And if it were that my husband and the rest of my family didn't give me that support, I couldn't do it. So, there came a time when they were talking, they said everything about me. I don't have anything more you could say about me. Yeah, okay? <laughs> say from here. They said everything in the world under the sun about me. Some very great things, of course, and some not so good things. And you reach a point where, look, let's forget that. They've done it, they've done it, they've done it. They'll do it again. You, have, you cannot have everybody loving you. Yeah? So, leave the detractors and just focus and do what you have to do. But I think Greg, um, he was one, well, like you, he's a medical doctor by the way, he was forever studying. And you know what that is? Whilst he's forever studying, I was forever studying too. Because he took so long to finish. <laughs> so he <laughs> at University in Jamaica. <laughs> he was just studying, studying. I think he, he failed one year, so he had to repeat year. So we got an extra year. So I did something else. <laughs> but he has been with me strong since I was 16 years old. And then I mentioned my father when I said he didn't want me to go traditional Indo training, okay? But he loved us and he did a lot of great things. So I didn't want us with this father's either. And we had a very stable home in that. And family life is so vitally important. Let me share one more story with you. When I heard what you talked about your children. 
I had my son in Los My son is Bobby Ramadu. He was born here. <laughs> um, so I'm here in Brooklyn. If you will study law or whatever, carry this big and walking around. And there's a girl from one of the other islands. We shared the same apartment. And I was getting the virus and coughing. Come on, you. What are you doing here? Why are you going to go home and stay with your husband? You can't home. <laughs> and she was happy to study law too, but was encouraging me not to do it. <laughs> it was amazing. Anyway, I survived all that. So, finish again. Go on after from that, they would lose me. But that is if you think, do any of these are, and you think doing medicines are, you do me. Ask me no, no, do a law school. <laughs> law school is like every day is like you're doing a whole brief. And then you have exams, like so episodes, you forever, like anyway. So my little boy you knows a couple of years old. Because I remember one weekend. But you know, you have people to help you. You have a housekeeper, hey, but they want these of you. But you have these assignments that are due, as I say, every. And I remember once on the this boy is in his chair, the high chair, you put your baby, he won't be able to have this thing to do. Please, please. And this child is screaming and he's crying and he's screaming and I'm all like, I don't want to give us on the correct. But God is great, I stay focused. I'm glad he knew from those who are at the top of my class, by the way. We want to do this to you. So thank you, God is great, I want to do all this. Thank you. Excellency, your sojourn in the Caribbean. I want to ask you about your thoughts of about Caribbean women. What is what has impressed you most about Caribbean women? Oh, that's a big question. I keep giving you the big ones, right? <laughs> what impresses me about women in the Caribbean? I think it's it's that self confidence. I have to say, it's it's. It's that badass attitude, and that's a compliment. <laughs> it is a compliment. I think women in the Caribbean are just badass. You just go and do it. And there's that self-confidence without arrogance. That, as I said, that, right? I consider my, myself a badass woman, so that's <laughs> So, yeah, that's, that's what I would, I would say. And, and from what you've, you've told about me, uh, I... I've been in the Caribbean for a long time. I've been uh, four years, I was four years in Jamaica. I traveled extensively throughout the region. I was uh, responsible for Haiti for a few years. So I've seen those badass women everywhere around the Caribbean. Um, so I, I, it is very impressive. Um, and very often when we talk about gender equality in the Caribbean, you know, we tend to say, um, but you know, there's, there's no issue with the Caribbean because look at all those women doing everything. But yet, there's still a lot of issues everywhere in Canada and everywhere, and including in the Caribbean. There's still a lot of inequality, and it's not because women have achieved so much that we have to stop doing things. So I, I, I am impressed. I continue to be impressed, and it's it's. Uh, it's something we have to continue doing. And we have to take that passion and, and continue using it to make a difference uh, every day. And, and uh, you know, I, I, even though women have achieved so much, there is still a lot of things we, we need to do, especially with young people. I, sh I want to share two stories that, that belong to experiences here. Um, Two years ago or three, I don't know, when I arrived, not long after I arrived, I was, I was on TV for something, I don't remember. And um, a staff member saw me and was with his family and uh, his, uh, his daughter, who was probably 10 or so, uh, was there with him and he said, oh look, that's the High Commissioner and uh, that's the work for her. And she looked at him and said, huh? A woman can be a High Commissioner? And that's here, in Barbados, two years ago. Um, and to me, when, when I heard that story, it, it didn't make sense to me. I said, what? In, in, in 2000, and what was it, 2016, at that time, I said, that's not possible that here, with all those badass women, <laughs> that there's still people, you know, young people who, who don't know that you can be whatever you want to be in life. A prime minister, a high commissioner, 
um, sitting on a board, you know, whatever you want to be, you can be. So, um, so I decided to do something, and uh, I created, for those of you who know, three years ago, this competition, Be High Commissioner for a Day, just to promote uh, women's rights in the Caribbean and, and talk about it and say, yes, you can do whatever you want to be doing in your life. But, and I will leave you with something that is my motto, has always been my motto for a long time. You know, if um, I always think that if our dreams don't scare us, it's because they're not big enough. Thank you. Thank you very much. So um, I would say, first of all, I'm thrilled to be here. Um, there's two uh, reasons I'm really glad that I'm here in this room for International Women's Day. But for me, I think the theme and the theme that I've actually been talking on a bit lately is I had to come to the realization myself beyond the education that I really belong in the room and can do what I need to do. Uh, I was telling a story the other day before at town I worked for a gentleman named Bob Johnson and Bob uh, founded Black Entertainment Television and uh, he sold BET for a couple billion dollars and started a new company, RLJ, and I grew that company. I was there for 13 years with him. I tell this story that we wanted to start a money management company at, at one time and we needed to partner with a large investment bank in New York. And for those of you who are in business and you've been to banker meetings, they always have these nice fancy meetings and they give you all that great food and the fancy pens and it's a great meeting, um, but if you're going and you're trying to ask them for something versus give them work uh, as a service provider, you know, you don't get the fancy pens or the food, uh, and they just kind of, what, what are you here for? So I walk into the meeting from another meeting, and there are 14 bankers in this uh, room. They are all white men, and Bob is there also. He's a black man, so one black man, uh, 14 white men, and me. So I walk in and Bob literally says one thing for the entire meeting. He says, wow, I can't believe, and anyone who knows Bob knows I'm not embellishing this story, I can't believe you did not bring one woman, one minority to this meeting with the only black billionaire in American business. He's like, you didn't even bring that analyst guy you keep in the back for these kinds of occasions. And then he just starts laughing. Um, and, you know, it's uncomfortable. It's awkward. I'm sitting there like, he just, and then he turns to me and he says, Lisa? And then I have to have the entire presentation for an entire hour and a half. I have to tell them what we want and this and that. So we walk out of the meeting. I'm furious. I'm like, Bob, first of all, why'd you make that joke? I, you know, it's awkward. And secondly, why didn't you say anything else the entire meeting? And he said, I'll never forget, he said, the reason I made the joke is because they have to know that it's not okay. Yes. Even when we are asking for something, it is not okay. And that's how we conduct ourselves even today at Ed Town. He said, and the reason I didn't say anything is because, Lisa, if you yourself do not feel like you belong in the room, you don't belong in the room. Um, and so I think, much like the Apple story, uh, that's what uh, has me here uh, today. Thank you so much. For that you see. Invite them for coffee somewhere, do something that isn't too expensive, take a walk on the boardwalk, and encourage and empower those girls. Because as we have been sharing here, there is so much other information out there that is a negative impact on how they see the world. You know? So there, there's all that information out there, and we need to be sure that we are doing all the grounding from it in homes, in our homes, in our communities, at the, the level of our schools, and that's where we would start. I don't think you need to have this kind of audience or you need to go into a school and talk to a whole classroom. If we start with where we're at, one at a time, one at a time we can make a difference. This is for Sandra Cesar. The value and power of a network of girlfriends. Tremendously important. Yes, my girlfriend. Welcome. <laughs> That it was very important to us when we were out there in the cold, struggling over many years, many decades, to try to do the best in our field. But um, there's something I want to share with you, uh, um, Carol, and with the ladies here. 
and this, it, I think this is very important uh, that I share this. Because all my missing choice here have made the point that you have to, you have to step up and you have to stand up. And I shared with you my long history of studying alongside Dr. Cesar so, <laughs> over the years. And um, when we came back to Jamaica, uh, I settled in at the UWI veteran, he was settled into his practice and so on. And then I decided I wanted to do law, which I had to come to Barbados. Because I had these previous degrees, I was exempted from the first year. And Trinidad only had the first year, so I had to come here. And then um, my girlfriends, the network of girlfriends is we come on, uh, you'll have to go to Steve Barbados. Or you'll be Greg right here. Suppose you pick up somebody else. <laughs> 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 okay. Well, okay. Uh, fine. And uh, an uncle of his, my husband's uncle, I shared this conversation and I really want to study this law and this law. It's bad and want to do it. And I thank God I did law by the way. Everybody I know I encourage them to study law. So, um, anything else you're doing is based on the law. And we feel, I'm sorry, if you do one course in law, please. So, uh, this uncle, yeah, uncle Bowerson. Uncle Sun, he's called Uncle Sun, old guy. And I was a poor uncle. He gave us a mental call. And I, I might lose school and then I'd pick up somebody else. And he looked at me very seriously. He said, Carla, consider this. What if you don't go and he still picks up somebody else? <laughs> <laughs> Isn't that amazing? That is amazing. 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 I always believe God is great, it will, it will pass. But you really ask me another question when I get to the result. That's okay. But it's a network of girlfriends, so they want to be telling me, God, I'm still, I'm not even me. That was a network. But the other great networks, I mentioned our concerns as a meal. Um, we ever remember there was a Connie and all those ladies that we worked with in, uh, in various places and so on. Um, over time, however, I found, being in this politics room for the greater part of the majority of my years, I find that um, that network is becoming, has become smaller and smaller. And the reason is because my life, and I'm sure Mia is finding it out more and more each day, when you become a prime minister, and I'm not being uppity about this thing, this is what happens, that your head and your work and the things you think about on a daily basis and the number of things, and I guess all my colleagues may find it so, but especially in the politics where you are in a fishbowl, in a glass bowl, that over time, it is very difficult to relate back. I still have the love for my school friends, university friends, I still have it. But it is very difficult that you sit on a Sunday evening or we decide to go to the beach as we used to, or we decide to like, Mia, some people are just going on there. So you cannot do, and you know, over time my friends have now realized you just can't. And some of the conversations that we would have, you really don't have time for that. It's not because you're being bad. It is just because there is just so much to do. So networking is tremendous. I think then with your peers it is very important. So some of my friends who did not go into politics or did not go into X or Y, I've lost some touch. We keep in touch you know, in special occasions. But I think um, you get the greatest networking from people are also in the field that you are in. In this very, as I told you, very rough and damaging field of politics, it's good to call me and say, call me yeah. Things back today. <laughs> and they say, Kamala, don't worry, you did that before. <laughs> God bless you all, and thank you for this opportunity to share with you. And I hope we can meet again. Carol, I remember very well from my days in opposition, which you're now Prime Minister, who was then in opposition, <laughs> campaigning in Barbados. I went down to a meeting, took me to a meeting. Where was it here? Way down in the countryside somewhere. I said that. You remember that. Yeah. I enjoyed it. So, God bless you all. We hope we meet again and go brave and go safe. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, we, we've come to the
And well, actually, my final question was for you, Lisa, and uh, it's an impromptu question because oh, really? uh, yes, because I saw you. So she gave yes, me the other question. <laughs> participating, yes, but you kept looking to see where Grace was and yeah. what was she doing. Does that ever stop? CEO, <laughs> captain of industry, does the nurturing and the mothering ever stop? No. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I probably told this story a few times. I understood then that I would never let fear intimidate me in my life. Never again. In those days, and all these Trinidadians that used to be in my house, <laughs> we had, in those days, London never used to build you monthly for telephones, they used to build quarterly. And I had a father who had us on a very strict allowance. In fact, the allowance was the same from day one to the end of year five. <laughs> I didn't understand the concept of inflation at all. We were like this thing that I nursed then to go and make my own. And that's how I got involved with Krakow and pulling the stores and managing vans and doing all other kinds of things. But our bill came in for a thousand pounds. Only monthly allowance was 360. <laughs> and the bill was a thousand pounds. And for two months, because I had three months to pay. For two months, and I can't sleep worrying about this thing. And I've been talking, but whenever you're going to sleep or waking up in the morning, and you're worrying about this girl, that I don't know how to tell this man <laughs> that I don't need money. I'm working still on the side trying to pick up a camera, but I can't make it work. So I decide now, exams coming up, and I decide finally, I'm going to do it in two stages, and I call on the Saturday. I said, Dad, I need to talk to you tomorrow. You can. <laughs> Perhaps I'd like to share the fear. <laughs> so the next evening I call him, I tell him, he said, what's wrong, what's wrong? I said, well, he said, what's wrong? I said, well, I'll tell you the truth when I'm telling the story to the phone. He said, that's all? You thought you were going to tell me a pregnant. <laughs> I share that because very often too much energy, anxiety, and pain is caught up in what we fear. And the truth is that I learned then to always establish what is the worst that can happen. And if you can accept the consequences of the worst that can happen, and if you accept that choice is really the I was about to say handmaiden, but, but the accompaniment to adulthood. That adulthood is about making choices more than anything else and accepting consequences. Then you begin to understand that you win some and you lose some. But that you can't always control. But the energy that you take in worrying about how to move from here to there is energy that you could be using to apply in a positive way. Now, these stories seem trite and funny and whatever, but I can assure you that these are the stories that make a difference to that girl in Bashaw's life, or to that mother in Jackson, or to that grandmother somewhere else, because how others navigate the pathway is an inspiration to others to be able to tell you you can get it. today. Maria and I had cause to talk on some things, and I had cause, I can't sing it now, it's in fear. But, but to remind the wonderful lyrics of Jimmy Cliff, and that wonderful song, you can get it if you really want. You try, you fear. You try and try and try. I'm gonna know this, I know this. You try again and you fear. Four, five, six, seven times. But there's a moment that you can still succeed. And you have to remain focused. Stay focused. The other thing that I want to say is, 
And this doesn't apply to politicians, although camera raised it, because I suppose we are the worst examples. I read a WhatsApp two weeks ago about me doing something to somebody in front of my gate, and I laughed. And the other person asked, well, why are you laughing? I said, because if you know anything about automatic gates, you would know that once a car in the middle of the gate, it can't close. <laughs> Where you are, it just becomes titillating or interesting for people to be able to say what they want. But once again, I learned early that you don't need so space in your head. Do you know what I mean? You don't need so space. And if you don't need so space to anybody, then you determine how the 24 hours, the 7 days, the 365 days, you control on what you do. So that does not mean that you don't get hurt, or that doesn't mean that you don't feel things, but you don't allow them to take you off of your path. Because the day you deviate from your path because of what they've done, they've won. They've won. And you remain and stay focused. And I want to repeat that because it isn't only about politics. I've been around long enough now to see women come to me and talk about it in the workplace, in the church, in community groups. They're more worried about what, who saying about who and who doing what. Stay focused and do the job that you have, not the job that you want. Do the job that you have, not the one that you want. Because too many people spend time trying to do or be something else rather than being able to stay true to themselves. So I want to celebrate these ladies here this evening. I want to thank Carol for an excellent interview. And I want to thank you because in a very real sense, what matters is not only what transpires here, but what you go and do with what you've heard here. And how it motivates you to action, whether in your family, or in your community, or your workplace, or your church.